Yo, 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 welcome to Crate 808. And today we have a very special guest on board, some of the best hand skills in the hip hop business. We've got percussionist and member of Cypress Hill, Eric Bobo, in the house. How are you doing, man? Yes, everything is great, man. Thanks for having me. You know, it's a pleasure. I'm glad uh, to be able to, uh, to chat with you, man. Oh, man, it's, it's a privilege to have you on, man. Uh, you've been doing amazing work and just like, yeah, we're going to get into it. Uh, before we do, though, Bobo, I've got to ask you, why well, I ask everyone who comes on the podcast, what's the least hip-hop thing you've done in the last 24 hours? The least hip-hop thing? Um, mm. uh, I think uh, water my plants. <laughs> That's good. I've not had <laughs> I've not had water my plant. You know, I'm a, I'm kind of a plant dad, so you know it's a nice relaxing. So you know, yeah, I like to take care of the, the the plant. So you know, I don't think that that's too uh, too hip hop, but it, it, it is what it is. It is it is what it is. It kind of depends on what plant it is as well, though, Bobo. It uh, you're gonna have yes. to, what what plant what plants are we talking here? Uh, we're talking about uh, pathos plants, uh, uh, Valentine plants, uh, you know, some uh, cactus. Uh, nice. You know, and things like that. Love it. Love that. Love that. I know everyone probably jumped to conclusions and thought of only one plant with a Cypress Hill member on board. I'm sure everyone went to that one plant, but we'll get we'll get there. We'll get we'll there. Get to that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get there. Yo, yo, yo. Quick reminder, if you're enjoying the show, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button so you'll be kept up to date with all that we're doing. And also, man, get involved in the YouTube comments. Man, we love hearing from you fellow hip hop heads. We love nerding out. So bring those takes and just bring that flavour, man, and we might even shout you out on the show so yes appreciate all the support now back to the episode but uh I, well new albums on the way uh, it's just great to have cyber Hill just back uh but i wanted to go back in time with you a little bit this is a 90s hip-hop podcast and i thought i had to ask you just on a personal level for yourself um 30 years cyber Hill's debut album came out last year right and a hugely impactful record i was wondering for you what did that record mean for you when it first landed? Wow, what it meant for me, it was incredible. It was something that I hadn't heard before. You know, I was uh, in in college uh, going to USC. Uh, I think it was like my final year there. And uh, I was actually going to pick up some weed. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and the guy was just like playing uh, Cypress Hill. And I'm, first of all, I'm like, are these guys talking about weed? And second of all, it was like, why does why does that guy the high pitched voice? Why does he sound like that? Talking about be real, you know. What I mean, I had not heard anything like that. It was so distinctive, and and the back and forth between him and Sen was like a reverse Public Enemy kind of thing, you know. Um, and, and just the sound, everything was like it was such a fresh sound because of, it combined different genres of music into this hip hop world. Whether it's like, you know blues elements, soul elements, Latin elements, you know, mm. and uh, it was something really, really fresh. And uh, who would have thought that maybe a, a year after hearing that record that I'd be on stage with them. That's wild. That's how amazing hip hop was back then. But I mean, you deserved it. You, you, you're incredible. Your work is incredible. Your dad's legacy is incredible. I, I was, you. I was wondering from that perspective of like, uh, maybe you've already touched on it, like the samples they were using, the high pitched like voice of Be Real with with mugs and obviously uh, Sen. For you though, is there something else to what you could call maybe Cypress Hill's X factor? Like, what is it that makes them stand out? You know, um, I, I, I think to be able to 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 talk about things uh, that you know that were going on, uh, real life things, and also the, the 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 cannabis part of it, like really like you know putting it out there, not in just like a stoner, but uh, you know, just being high type of thing, but just in the context of how they were putting it. Be real is an excellent writer, and. For, for me, it was just done in an intelligent way, uh, but it was still street. You know, it was still had that gangster touch to it. You know, it wasn't a West Coast sound. Uh, people kind of likened it more to an East Coast sound because there's Cypress Hill in New York, and people just thought that it was 
East Coast and not really realizing that, you know, uh, it's basically a West Coast group, even though Muggs was born and raised out there in New York. Hmm. Um, and and just that 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 factor, the fact of, of really, you know, pushing pushing the, the envelope, you know, and something that a lot of rappers really weren't doing, you know. I mean, yes, you have conscious, you know, rap like, you know, I mean, Public Enemy that, Mm. really was telling a story and, 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 and letting you know how, how it is, but, you know, in, in a, in a lighter way, you know, Cypress Hill was, was doing the same way, but just adding this other element. And, and, and at that time, you know, the cannabis talk was really kind of taboo. You know, I think Cypress really opened up that door and, um, you know, really to be able to, see it evolve through the years that now we're 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 now in, I'm in a state that it's legal and that there's like 26 states that either are legal or you know medicinal and just to be able to live and see that happening is is, is incredible so i think it was just you know all of that all of that combined mm. Yeah, absolutely amazing. And let's not downplay the role you guys played in that movement, man. It was huge. I remember just getting the Black Sunday hemp leaflet, you know, and being like, yes. and I didn't smoke as a kid, but that was amazing. So I don't, I hadn't read that before. So you guys were literally educated as well as entertaining as you did. And I found it's amazing how you did that. I was going to go back to what you said then about like, you couldn't believe in a year you'd gone from listening to this amazing record to being on stage with Cypress Hill Live. Tell me about how that journey worked in that year. What happened there? Well, well, basically, you know, I had I had left college and um my you know, not that I graduated, I left college and I remember my mom saying, Okay, you got a year to do something and if you don't do anything in a year, you gotta you gotta go back. I said, all right, bet. Um, I, I got an opportunity to do, to do uh, the wedding of one of the Beastie Boys and uh, Ad-Rock. Right. Uh, and that led to me starting to go on tour with them. Yo, yo, yo. Us here at the Crate 808 podcast have kicked off our Patreon. So if you don't know what Patreon is, it's a platform where you can go and for a small donation, you can help support us make more hip hop content for you. Go on to patreon.com forward slash Crate 808 and you can check out all the little payment options you've got there. You can check out the two new episodes you'll be getting every month. Live chats with us guys just to rap nerd out with you guys. We're going to go into some wide ranging episodes delving into the work of the Wu-Tang Clan, MF Doom, and Jay Diller. So get it locked if you want that new granular look at hip hop. So go to our payment tiers on Patreon, big up yourselves. If you choose to support us, thank you so much. I will give you a personalized shout out on the show and we shall catch you in one of these live rooms and let's get this community going. So spread the word, much love for your time and peace out, boom. In my first tour with, with the Beastie Boys, it was BC Boys, Rollins Band, and the first uh, two weeks, it was Ice Cube and the Lynch Mob. The next two weeks was with Cypress Hill. So it's like both of my worlds kind of collided in this one tour. And um, Sen and I, we we had, you know, we were hanging out on the tour, and I was hanging out on their tour bus and kind of said, yo, you know, you want to jam with us? You should jam with us. And... Um, from the one show, the first show I did with them was at, uh, at El Camino College. Mm. And they had like some sort of event that they were doing these concerts every year there. And uh, before you know it, you know, I was really hanging out with them. I was doing all this stuff and I got invited to join them on the 93 Soul Assassins tour, which was Cypress Hill, House of Pain, Funk Dubious, oh. The Hooligans, Damn. which included a uh, Scotty Khan, that's James Khan's son, and uh, a young alchemist who was like fourteen or so years old. <laughs> that's mad. And, and it, it was it was crazy. And and I I always had my foot into hip hop as growing up. You know, I was influenced. You know, by early early hip hop and everything. Even though I was doing the Latin jazz thing with my dad and 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 following in that realm, but all the samples, all the things, all the rhythms, I already knew. So to me, it was like a perfect marriage. And if you 
listen to early hip hop, it, it was done by live musicians and there was a lot of percussion in there. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't that it was something that was really foreign to the hip hop thing. So, but it just wasn't presented in a live, in a live form, like how we were doing it. And uh, from then on, from that tour on, it's like, I've been there. So it was, that was like, Black Sunday was just coming out. So like when we went and we traveled to Europe in their first headlining tour in Europe, I was there and just to see how it was growing in other parts of the world was amazing. Mm. So the journey it was incredible to be able to, to, to do that. Yeah, that's amazing. You've touched on so many things there. One thing, one thread I want to pull with you is, uh, I mean, this is the thing. This is the hip hop. It's a beautiful thing as a 90s head to see the hip hop I loved with you guys to still be informing young people's music today with people like Alchemist and people like that who were under your wings. Did you ever even fathom where someone like Al- where he would have taken it when you've been, you know, in close facility to him with the Soul Assassins? I mean, no, I mean, he, he, he definitely had a hunger, you know, and he was, you know, he was rapping, you know, he wasn't really doing, you know, he wasn't really heavy, that heavy into the beats as of yet, mm-hmm. you know, Muggs kind of took him under his wing. And then when he moved to New York to go to school, you know, he, he started messing around with DJ Premier. So to be able to have those two mentors kind of helping to shape, you know, what what he was doing and, and to now him being one of the top hip hop producers out, you know, even to this day, uh, was incredible. I mean, I think all of that was an influence on all of us, you know, really. I mean, because hip hop at that time, there was so many hip hop groups, but everybody had their own sound. Mm. everybody i mean it was strong and it was really the, the the golden era as they say the golden era i mean we consider ourselves not members of the old school but of the gold school <laughs> you know what i mean we're 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 there you know what i mean yeah and and like i said i mean to to see some of those groups you know forming up and it, it was a beautiful beautiful time and, and to still be doing it now and still be relevant Mm. is amazing 30 years later you know yeah man and those beats bang bro just to give you a heads up like you still put that those first four five six albums cypress albums they bang still and yeah something to this day yeah they do they're magic man there's magic in there uh talking to magic then because you just touched on black sunday and seeing it in europe and seeing that kind of you know massive following it got over here why do you think that album stands out like in the cypress canon and in hip-hop in hip-hop generally wow i mean because again it was its own sound nobody had the sound like that the way that cra- uh that mugs crafted the beats the way uh b and sen were able to just you know complement all of that was amazing and and no one was really doing it like that with that sound and I think that it resonated all over the world. I mean, look, um, when you have songs like Kids from the Bong and I Want to Get High, I mean, people were smoking, even though it might have not been legal, but people were smoking everywhere. That, mm-hmm. that was the thing, you know? And, and I think that we were able to, you know, resonate with, with those people and we gave them a voice. And um, it, it was a big influence. So I I really believe that Cypress Hill's place in history, you know, cannot be denied because we really, uh, you know, touched on a lot of uh, a lot of genres and also that we were accepted by the alternative and rock, you know, crowd, you know, because of the imagery. You know, we we had rock and roll imagery, you know, our, our, our covers, the skull, the things like that. You know, it didn't look like it was a hip hop record, you know, Mm. but we were able to transcend and and combine those genres. And, you know, there were a lot of people that said, you know what, I really don't listen to hip hop, but I love Cypress Hill. It was always like that. I mean, and we're talking about heavy metal bands and and heavy duty, like, wow, you know, Mm. and that's big because not a lot of groups, you know, since then were able to really do that. I mean, Aside from people like the Beastie Boys uh, or or maybe even Wu-Tang, mm. you know, but 
it, it's you know you it's very hard to to get accepted in like an all rock festival on our or an alternative festival and be able to bang it out you know yeah and we were able to do that yeah but and just as a real-time anecdotal evidence to what you've just said there bobo right i remember even woo and e like they were not getting played in, i was in the whitest school ever in a little village in yorkshire northern england right and i tell you what when we were there and i was i would try to play biggie i tried to play jigger i tried to play pack i tried to play woo nothing would fly except for cypress hill they were the only group I was allowed or or that you would see other pockets of indie heads, metal heads, you know, Metallica heads. They listened to Cypress. Temples of Boom was on heavy rotation. And I was like, damn, what is it about this group? That I loved it. I was like, okay, I can have this one group. I'll have that. But yeah, just to give you some evidence to exactly what you've said, that's exactly how it was in England. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. Absolutely, man. I was going to actually say to you then, just before we move into a bit of Beastie Boys chat with you, uh, you've, you're from the jazz community. You you have a heritage in that community. What I find interesting in 1990s hip hop is how other musical communities kind of uh, treated hip hop and, and maybe approached it. Did you ever feel or, or like get held back by any parts of the jazz community or was, or was it quite a, 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 like everyone worked together quite well? You know, uh, to be honest, uh, there were a lot of uh, uh, jazz purists that kind of came down on me, you know, for like, oh, that's not real music, you know, samples, things like this. There's no musicians and everything like that. And I didn't I really didn't understand, like, why? why? You know, I mean, music is like the universal language. And why would you down something that is really I think hip hop helped the jazz community because of the samples that were that were used. I mean, you hear Gangstar. Gangstar used a lot of jazz samples. The soul, the soul groups, you know, a lot of them, you know, were were doing quite well with, you know, people that were sampling their records. And after a while, it's like, yo, you can't, you know, you can't really knock it. I mean, because they're helping to expand that you know and a lot of producers a lot of people were like opening up their ears to be like be able to be like wow it came from this record it came from a lot of these jazz jazz records i mean run dmc's um you know uh what uh, not runs house a uh, beats to the rhyme mm. that that thing right there that's a, from bob james that's a straight jazz fusion record mm. you know what i mean and Hip hop put money in a lot of these people's pockets, you know. So to to really be anti and too much, you know, what I mean, I, to me, I really didn't understand it. But you you know, you fast forward, you know, there's a lot of lot of them now that they appreciate it because you know the the jazz. I'm sorry to say it, but the jazz uh, genre was starting to go down a little bit, you know, and it's not something that was in the forefront the way that it was in like the seventies or the sixties or, or before that. So I think that hip hop really extended that olive branch to be like, yo, you know, we can do this together. And now you see hip hop groups or hip hop artists that are now having bands behind them, having these musicians that are very well skilled in jazz, you know, mm -hmm. uh, Kendrick Lamar, Nas, all these people that they, that, they are embracing the jazz thing and be able to like make it into their own. So, yeah. uh, yeah, it was, it, it was, it was difficult at first, but I didn't let that deter me because, uh, I knew that I was, I was onto something, you know, bigger than, than that. Yeah. Visionary man. Absolutely. Definitely. Uh, so we talked a little bit there about BC's ad rock wedding that all, it already sounds incredible how that all kind of came to work. But, um, you're then with the Beasties. I was wondering, what was the difference working and recording and performing with Beastie Boys in comparison to Cypress Hill? Um, wow. Well, I mean, with with the Beasties, when I got with them, they, you know, had gotten, you know, they started to pick up their instruments. And a lot of their influences was that, that old, like, funk, soul, jazz kind of thing. The meters, uh people like that mm. and a lot of this soul. So they were trying to recreate 
that sound in their way. And um, they were doing it in a live sense. And and with with Cypress, you know, it was it was like with the samples, everything like that, it was really a, you know, it was a celebration of music, you know, really. Mm. And, you know, my time with the BCs, I mean, we were coming up with, we were just jamming. We were jamming and, and seeing what comes, what came out. Mm. And a lot of the things like sabotage and and things like that all came out of jams. So it was, you know, we, we connected as musicians and that was something that I was really familiar with. And with Cypress, you know, me being the only live, <clears throat> the live musician at the time, you know, before we brought out a band and we were doing like the rock thing, um, you know, it was like something I had an open canvas to like try different things. And it was just me, you know, they, they let me free. They like saying, you know, what do you hear on this? What do you hear on that? And they trusted my, they, they trusted what I was doing because I had that lineage. I had that experience to be like, you know what, this can work here and this can work there and this can work here. And they, they trusted me in my knowledge of music. So, you know, in a way, you know, there were similar, similar things, but then also, uh, I think that Cypress wasn't afraid to to uh, push the envelope and they did it in a few different ways than what the BCs did. But all in all, in both groups, we made great music. Yeah, man, absolutely. I was just a Bobo on the corner earlier. I was the Shambhala. Shambhala's still a brilliant song. Like People should go out and check that song out because it's just one of them ones that kind of maybe gets lost a little bit. But wow, it's incredible. And it does sound, those ill communication like sessions do sound really free form. So I'm glad that you were, you said it was kind of jamming because it feels like yeah. that. And yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was that and, and at that and at that time, you know, we had been, you know, oh, you know, we had started to gel as a band. So when we went in and recorded uh ill communication, I think believe that that was like the album that they did in the shortest amount of time. That album really took us like six months. But wow. we had gelled so much as a band and our communication was musical communication was incredible. Uh, we were tight and nobody was really doing it like how we were doing it. Mm. So, you know, we kind of like opened up, you know, the, the fans ears to like, wow, you know, look, look at this jam, you know, you, you know, the Shambhala, like you said, you know, that's not, you know, you wouldn't consider that hip hop, but again, hip hop is not just a boom bap thing. Hip hop is a real, musical thing that encompasses a lot of different genres into one and you put it into the pot and there it was. So, you know, it was, it was punk, it was hip hop. It was all of that, you know, mm -hmm. and you know, we, 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 we were able to, to make some noise. With yeah, that. man, absolutely. And people forget beasties were a punk band when they first come out, they were a punk band. So exactly. the roots of hip hop are not just as easy as some people think, man. Uh, it's, it's quite complicated, but I wanted to go on with you then to, to Mary Jane, to marijuana, to weed, to, as we talked about, I had a few fun questions I wanted with you, right? I've heard some yeah. stories. We've all heard Cypress Hill stories when it comes to this kind of stuff. But uh, I would like to ask you, what is it like smoking with Dan Aykroyd? Wow. <laughs> that was crazy. I mean, I was in a session with the Black Crows. Now, mind you, you know, when my work with the BCs in Cyprus, I was attracting, you know, other groups that were like, yo, man, we want to get some of that sound. So uh, Chris Robinson of the Black Crows reached out and I, it was Send Dog that said, yo, you know, uh, the Black Crows, they, they want you to, to, to play with them. And during these sessions, you know, the rock and roll world is a whole other different thing. It's a whole other different party. And, uh, you know, Chris Brown said, yeah, I'm having a couple of friends come by. And all of a sudden I see Dan Aykroyd come in and I'm like, holy shit. I was telling Send Dog, yo, you need to come down and check this out. I was letting B and them talk, yo, you need to come down here because this is some whole different shit. Yeah. But again, they were listening and there were people now what, you know, Cypress Hill was doing. And, and to know that, I mean, of course, you know, weed and the weed smoking thing like that, not a lot of celebrities were that out with it. So you might not have known who was smoking, who was not. Mm. But when you see like Dan Aykroyd 
go into his pocket and open up a jar of his weed, I was like, holy shit. This is this is fucking incredible. Mm. I mean, Dan Aykroyd, I know him from Blues Brothers, Saturday Night Live, very funny and everything like that, partnered with John Belushi. I'm like, oh my God, I made it. You know what I mean? Yeah. To be able to be able and, and try to keep my composure and still in my mind, I'm like, it's fucking Dan Aykroyd <laughs> right in front of me right now. And it, it, it was it was amazing. It was amazing. So mm. to get exposed to to all of that and, and just to find out that a lot of these people were also Beastie Boy and Cypress Hill fans, you know. And again, it goes back to like, you know, there's some hip hop artists or, or that, you know, that some people, they, they kind of stand away from because it might be a little bit too hard for them. It might be a little bit too gangster for them and you know they don't have a, a relation uh to that but you have groups like public enemy uh beastie boys cypress hill and 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 the like like that that it kind of made it like okay you know this is cool i can ride with this mm-hmm. i like this you know what i mean and it wasn't as threatening yes even though i mean we have songs like oh i can just kill a man but it wasn't talking about killing people it was almost like a defense you know like yo, this is what I got to do. And, and this is real life as far as the police brutality that was going on then. Mm. And all of that kind of stuff still stands to this day, you know. Mm. But I think that Cyprus, uh, Chuck D, even the Beastie Boys, storytellers. Storytellers. It's not just rapping and being bravado about it, but they're painting a picture for you. And they... Sometimes artists, they can paint a picture like that. And to you, you can be like, wow, I can see it. It's very visual. And I think that that was the appeal to a lot of these, you know, people that were like, I, I you know, I'm kind of on the fence with hip hop, but I like Cypress Hill. I love BC Boys. You know, it, it, I love Public Enemy. It wasn't a white or black thing. It was how you were able to relate mm-hmm. with it, you know, and I, I think that that was key. Yeah, absolutely. That you nailed it. Absolutely. Uh, on that session, on the sessions, then I wanted to ask if there was any. Se- well, here's uh, I'll do two 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 questions for you. Any sessions you'd love to relive, or what sessions? Who do you wish you could have smoked with? Wow, uh, the the Temple of Boom sessions kind of stand out in my mind. They were, I mean, we were under pressure to really deliver another, you know, Black Sunday. You know, the label wanted another insane in the brain. Mm. And, you know, Cyprus has never been one to to kind of repeat, you know, they want to go forward. And there was a, you know, it was a kind of a difficult time when, you know, Sand had, you know, left for a little while like in the middle of those sessions and didn't come back to the fold until uh, the ending sessions of Cypress Hill 4. So a lot of chips were stacked up against us. Um, but we we soldiered on and just that feeling of like, you know, when your back is up against the wall, you know, there's nothing to lose at this point. We just got to go forward. That feeling uh, it w- was something that was magical Scary, but magical at the same mm. time. Um, who would I like to? Who, who would I like to smoke with? Wow, <laughs> <laughs> uh, man. Um, I, I I don't know. I I, I would have loved to smoke with Bob Marley. Oof. I would I, I would have loved to you know to do something and play in that that realm or you know with the sons that are like <clears throat> embracing the marijuana, you know, stance and, and still come up with some great music, mm. you know, but people like that, that, that got it. They understood it. You know, it wasn't a threatening thing. They wasn't, you know, they were about it, yeah. you know, and that, that, that's what, that's what I think would have been a great, a great fit for me. Yeah. Love that. Absolutely. Agree with you. Uh, so new album then, new albums coming out back in black. Yes. Uh, yes. It hyped for it. Black Milk's on board with you guys. Where? How? What set 
the wheels in motion for this for this album then? Um, <clears throat> basically, uh, we were working a little bit on Elephants on Acid. And then there was a period that uh, the time kind of stalled, you know. Mm. And during this time, you know, I mean, we were like, yo, you know, we need to get something going on. We didn't know if Elephants was going to really be finished or get get out there. So B Real and I were like, yo, you know, maybe we should try something with, you know, some other people. And then I kind of like, all right, let's take this challenge. And I mean, reaching out to people like Alchemist, reaching out to people like Mad Lib and things like that, combinations like that. Mm. And at the moment, at during that time, I was really into the group Random Acts, which was uh, Sean Price, mm. uh, Guilty Simpson, and Black Milk and doing a lot of production. And there was something about Black Milk Speaks that were like, man, this would be kind of dope. So I had brought up uh, the suggestion that maybe we should try with Black Milk. Because, you know, I mean, we were trying some with Mad Lib and those sessions really didn't work out in the way that we planned. Uh, but I said, well, what about Black Milk? And then uh, we got in touch with him. He started sending over all these beats and B and Sam were just vibing with them. And, and before you know it, song after song after song were coming out. So basically um, this album was kind of almost done before Elephants on Acid was. Wow, okay. So, so we, it's like we had one like in the can, just in case Elephants wasn't going to be ready, we had something in the can. Then we got back to to, to elephants and then that scene rolled ahead and people were really like wanting to hear another Cypress album with mugs at the helm. Mm. So this was really something for the fans, you know what I mean? And, you know, well, we, we just kind of sat on the record. And since then we kind of changed some things around as far as some of the songs, we worked some of the songs mm. and finally it's going to see the light of day. Uh, back in black and it's great because to me cypress works great with one producer mm. like the focus of it you know i mean rise up was was the first album that there were multiple producers and things like that and they're all great uh but it, in some ways it can be disjointed because it's like one person got this sound when we're trying to combine mm. all these sounds and make it very cohesive for sure. And all of Cypress albums, you know, under mugs and stuff like that. And now back in black have been cohesive, more cohesive as far as sound and direction. Mm. So, uh, I think what black milk brings to the table is still, you know, you're going to get that, that, that darkness of Cypress Hill, but in a, in another kind of boom bap, kind of level and i think that both be real and sin uh fucking they, they nailed it and i think that people are going to be very very impressed with sin dog i think that this album this is like my favorite that i've heard from sin wow and and and, and just to put it out there i mean there hasn't been a cypher so album that it's been both be real and sin on all the tracks back in black it's both of them on all the tracks. Right. So you're going to hear, you're going to hear some, some cool shit. Yeah. Can't wait for that. That sounds amazing. You're absolutely right. We had Sen on and he sounds so hyped for it. It sounds, I'm looking forward to listening to it, man. Definitely. Um, so what role, just out of interest, what role is, did Muggs play? Was he more exec? Was he more look overseeing the thing or is he not part um, of it? Or? No, no, no. Uh, as far as back in black, it was black milk and, mm. and the rest of us, right. um, Mugs really didn't touch uh, touch this record. Okay, but I think that it is a a, a perfect segue going in from coming from Elephants mm. uh, and then doing this record to to the next record, which will be again produced by Mugs. Right, I've heard a few lines about that one, the one after this, which is it, it's probably going to be Cypress Hill's last record. Is that is there truth to that or? 
What do you think? Um, in, in, in the conventional release uh, sense, uh, right. we're going to continue to make music, but we feel that the, you know people are not listening to albums like how we are used to mm. listening to an album. You know, it, it, it's a singles uh, world now, you know, yeah. you're able to pick out your singles and, you know, the attention span is not like how it was to be able to, man, I want to listen to this whole record. Of course, you have people that are that are in there, but it's, you know, you can release singles, you can release things like that. And people like there, you know, and it's hot mm. and it's the shit and then they move on, you know, and we've always been uh, an album based group. I mean, we were never a single based group, you know, some songs just happen to be singles, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? But uh, it's not the end of making music for Cypress Hill, but in the way that we release it, as far as a conventional release an album, that might change. That's mm -hmm. not to say that there may never be another full Cypress Hill record, but I think now with our catalog, you know, we can come out with songs, a few songs, you know, throughout the year and then release it as a cohesive, you know, collective, mm. you know, but uh, definitely Cypress, it doesn't put it out there. Cypress Hill is not going to stop making music, but just in the conventional release sense and the setup of an album and to do all that, you know, it just doesn't feel the same. And I don't think that, you know, I think that the crowd are more like single bass, you know, mm. you have iTunes and Spotify and things like that. You hear what's, what's, you know, the song that you like, and then that's it. You know, you kind of like maybe not go deeper into the album, yeah. but hopefully that'll come back at some point because, you know, I do miss, you know, I look forward to if someone's new album coming out and they're like, man, I can't, I want to listen, kick back and listen to the whole record, you know, not just hear the single that they're playing on the radio or anything. I want to listen to the record as a whole, mm. as a story. And you know that that's what I miss, but that that's that's to clarify that whole statement. Uh, that's probably what will happen for the immediate future, but never say never. Yeah, man. Okay, love it. Love that, man. I can't wait for the new album. Uh, yeah, people out there, go check out. We all know Cypress drops. Everyone goes checks it out, so it's all good. But yeah, man. But I've got to ask you then before you leave. Uh, ask everyone the same question before they do make a move. Uh, what is the last great piece of music you heard? It could be old, it could be new, just the last great piece you heard, Bobo. You know, there's this group that's actually from the UK mm -hmm. uh, that I just got put on to, and their name, uh, the, the group's name is Salt. Oh, man. I thought you were going to say and Salt. <laughs> salt. They, I mean, and look, they they do, look how they release it. You don't know who exactly is in the group. They don't do promotion. They don't tour. They just release music. But their music and their melodies and the things like that, it's like, it, it's fucking amazing. So I'm like, holy shit. And, you know, you can't sleep on the UK. You cannot sleep on the, uh, on the UK and, and and the creative minds that and that are out there because I think that also in Europe in general that you know there's more open to different sounds. They're not stuck on you know just a few things. They're way more open to different types of music. And the fact that you know you have a group like that that you can really listen to them like wow man this is like the sounds the melodies the bass lines. The the, the 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 drum the the drum breaks and things like that. It's like I, I I found myself you know once I heard them I'm like listening to all of their stuff and like man this is a dope group. So mm. I'd have to say salt. Man, you you've touched all the right spots for me. Salt, absolutely incredible. Uh, and yeah, we've talked about them a few times on this show. But yeah, absolutely here for more of it. Uh, but yeah, man. Before, but, but you just touched on the UK. Is there any plans UK tour? Are you? Is there any plans for a leg to come visit us over here? Yeah. Oh, let's go. Yeah, let's yeah, go. Yeah, and, and 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 you know, I, I I can't really say dates now, but yes, it will be this year. Oh. 
So, no, yeah. so we we we're coming, we're coming, and with the lineup that we're coming with, uh, it's gonna be fucking amazing. No. You know, you just, you just have to wait for the official announcement, but it's 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 gonna be it's gonna be amazing. Wicked, but well, that's got that's got me appetite wetted. Absolutely, can't wait. But thank you so much for the for the time. Thank you for your yeah, you know, just contribution to music. And yeah, man, just just keep keep on doing it and keep pushing, man. And and thank you very much. And uh, the last thing I probably like to mention is the fact that the Cypress Hill documentary oh. that is coming out uh, on four twenty uh, finally, you know, going to have that come out, and it's it's. It's great to 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 great great to get the the Cypress Hill story out there, the origins, the things like that. Yeah. So look forward to that coming out and for all the Cypress fans to 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 check out. So April twentieth is dropping. Four twenty, boom! What a way to end it. What a brilliant bombshell to end it on. I love that. Yeah, cannot wait. Let's do this. Right, man. Yes. Peace. Thank you so Thank much. You. you got it, man. Peace out. <laughs> Peace. Thank hey, you, man. Bobo. Appreciate you, man. You, take, it. you take it easy. Uh, I'll All probably right. release this next week or so, but good luck with the launch. And yeah, thank you for your time, man. Appreciate you. Thank you, man. And hope to see you when we reach out there to the UK, man. Bro, I'll be there. Front Come row. through. <laughs> Front right, row with the, with the J. Don't worry, I'll be there. Yes, sir. <laughs> thank you, my man. Take it easy, bro. All Peace. Right.